Welcome back to another week, another lecture in chemistry. So uh, this is the week five. We're finishing up. This is our very last lecture of chemistry in natural sciences class. Uh, this is week five, lecture J, and it's the second lecture on nuclear reactions. We have introduced alpha decay, beta decay, gamma decay, positron emission. These are types of radiation that are emitted from atoms called radioisotopes or radionucleotides that are unstable atoms and they decay to produce other things. We've already talked about turning um, lead into gold and other kinds of interesting things that are actually possible in nuclear chemistry. We wanna uh, begin with beta particles. We've already talked about alpha particles, okay? Now, a beta particle is emitted from a radi radioactive event or a nuclear event where an atom undergoes um, a decomposition in a sense, and it doesn't look like much has changed. It looks like we've just emitted a high energy electron, okay? So remember that a beta particle is a high energy electron. given that symbol there, its atomic mass is zero. Remember, this top left number is the atomic mass or the mass number, and we get that by adding the protons and neutrons. This is just an electron with no protons or uh, neutrons, so its total mass is zero, and uh, the total number of protons is normally written down on the bottom left-hand corner of, of this side here, but since an electron is negatively charged, we have a negative one there. And we use that negative one to kind of balance these nuclear uh, reactions, as you'll see in a bit. So in this uh, reaction, what happens is a neutron within this unstable nucleotide, nucleotide changes into a proton and a high energy electron, okay? So let me just write it like that for now, okay? Now remember that a neutron is neutral and a proton is positive one and an electron is negative one. So when a neutron, which is a neutral uh, particle, changes into a positive and a negative, it kind of cancels each other out and it has no net charge formation, okay? So we're not forming anything that's charged per se, okay? Now. The um, neutron changes to a proton, so the mass number is going to stay the same, okay? We'll talk about this in a bit more, but there's a 14 for the mass number of carbon, and there's a 14 for the mass number of nitrogen. And you might be wondering, well, how does the mass not change? Well, it technically does, but we round things off to the whole numbers here. Nitrogen has an atomic mass number of about one, and a proton has an atomic mass of about one atomic mass unit. So the mass numbers all cancel out, okay? And we do go from six to seven, okay? Because we are making a new proton, we're creating a proton. So we're changing that from element six to element seven. So remember we talked about alpha emission, how you're losing two protons when an alpha particle is emitted from an atom. So you're going down by two units uh, in the periodic table, okay? So if you start with element 92, you're gonna go down by two to element 90 because the alpha particle removes two protons. In this situation, you're making only one proton, okay? You're gonna go, you're gonna change a neutron to a proton, so the mass is the same, but you're gonna be creating a proton in the nucleus of the atom, so you're gonna go up by one. So here we're going from carbon, which is element six, to nitrogen, which is element number one, okay? And this beta particle goes flying off into the air. All right, so here we have carbon-14, and here we have nitrogen-14, and uh, this radioactively decays to produce a stable molecule of nitrogen-14, okay? Um, perhaps I should go to the next slide so you can kind of see this balanced equation a little bit better. Uh, 
Uh, this is carbon-14, which is radioactive. Of all the carbon atoms in, uh, in the environment, one out of one trillion are gonna be this radioactive form of carbon. So you don't need to be concerned with your pencil being radioactivity, radioactive. One out of every one trillion atoms is radioactive. So it's not like a significant source of radioactivity. It's not dangerous to use your pencil in a normal way and so on, okay? This is used in radioactive carbon dating and we'll talk more about that in the future, okay? So it's radioactive. It's unstable, and over time, it produces nitrogen-14. And a beta particle, okay, so this right here, it's, it's just an electron, a high energy electron, but we call that a beta particle. Now, remember the two rules for balancing chemical equation. The mass number or the top left number has to be equal. So if I look on the left side of this equation, I see 14 right here. And then on the right side of the equation, I see 14. And then I have a plus sign and then I have a zero. So that is mass balanced. We haven't created any kind of mass or destroyed any kind of mass to a first approximation here. Next, we look at the bottom numbers, okay? The bottom numbers have to be equal, and this is why we have that strange negative one here. If you lose a proton, that's pretty much a very rare time you'll see a negative number in a balanced chemical equation or a nuclear uh, equation, okay? But on the left, we have six, okay? This number six has to equal all the other numbers on the right-hand side, so seven plus a minus one, is the same thing as seven minus one. So six is equal to six, okay? So the mass number is balanced and the atomic number is balanced, okay? We don't really say that's an element with an atomic number of minus one. You know, we, we use that symbolism there so that we could follow the balancing procedure, okay? So that's beta emission. The third type of radioactivity is gamma emission. We've talked about alpha particles, which are helium atoms basically ejected out from a nucleus. We talked about beta emission, which is a high energy electron emitted from an atom. And a gamma particle is just a very energetic photon or a, a wavelength of light, okay? Much more energetic than x-rays. So as we'll see, uh, they can easily penetrate through uh, clothing, uh, a certain amount of concrete, uh, even your, your, the human body, it can pass through, okay, and cause significant damage. So gamma rays are very high energy uh, forms of radiation. And let me show you that normally gamma rays are emitted with many other They're emitted with many other forms of radiation. So if we have a radioisotope and let's say it decays by alpha emission, oftentimes it does release a gamma ray at, at the same time. So it emits two or more different kinds of radiation. One uh, isotope that's used in diagnostic mes medicine is technetium 99M. M stands for metastable. Technetium is an interesting element that's located right here in the periodic table, right where my finger is located, capital T, lowercase c. Um, and it does not occur in nature as a substance that's stable, okay? It's only made during uh, nuclear reactions or radioactive decay of radioactive waste and things like that. So we can synthesize it, make it, use it, and, uh, and mail it to other... Um, you know, hospitals and things like that used to image uh, tumors in the brain and other kinds of things, okay? So technetium 99M, which is metastable, transforms to, uh, I'll put these in the right spot here, sorry. And I don't want to explain what the M means and how the configuration of the new, it's a, it's an unstable high energy intermediate of the nucleus itself. So it's kind of super exciting, but anyway, it relaxes 
And when it relaxes, it releases that excess energy in the form of a gamma ray. And we use a uh, Greek symbol uh, gamma here. Okay, sometimes it looks like like, like this uh, gamma. Okay, like an upside down Y. All right. Uh, we uh, so this right here is uh, it's pure energy. It has no mass. It has no charge. So it has zero and zero, and it's just a basically a high energy light. Okay. So that's gamma uh, emission. Now, let me talk about transmutation. In the YouTube video clip we watched, um, Dr. Shaka at University of California, Irvine was changing mercury into gold. And he was doing that in a nuclear reactor. A nuclear reactor emits all kinds of particles. And if those particles impinge upon the nucleus, you can add more neutrons and protons to the nucleus and make it a different element that's bigger, okay? So you can change a smaller element into a bigger element. And here's an example of that. And this is done all the time in different um, sorts of applications. Uh, one of the applications I am very fond of is the synthesis of very high atomic mass elements. So element 118 is synthesized by smashing together two lighter elements. And like Play-Doh, the protons and neutrons stick inside each other and form a much larger nucleus of an atom. And then before that has a chance to radioactively decay very quickly, scientists are able to identify what they have and even sometimes what the properties are, uh, chemical properties are of that new element. And that's done by transmutation. So atom smashers are a form of transmutation. Transmutation, strictly speaking, is changing one element into another. So you can change mercury to uh, gold, the gold will be radioactive. That's not very good. So here's an example. <clears throat> this, remember, is an alpha particle. You just need to remember three. This is an alpha particle, okay? <clears throat> and that right there will impinge upon other things like boron. And um, before me, I, I just throw the answer down here and you watch me do it. Let's try to figure out what that might be, okay? So we know the rules that we uh, need to add these two numbers, right? The total is on, uh, on, the, on the left is seven. So my mystery thing I'm gonna uh, form right here has seven total protons, okay? Because the alpha particle has two protons and the boron here has five protons, okay? <coughs> and then uh, what we form here, you might be thinking is four plus 11 is 15, okay? And what we do form is a couple different things. We form nitrogen and we form a neutron. So if I look at the numbers on the right, I actually have 14, plus one, okay? So four plus 11 is 15, and 14 plus one is um, 15, okay? So you're changing boron into nitrogen, and this is just a side thing that, that gets kicked off in the process, okay? Uh, so this is a new radioactive uh, nucleus. Oftentimes, when you do transmutation and you make something else, uh, you can have a radioactive uh, nucleus, okay? Element uh, 105 is right here in the periodic table, right where my pen is pointing to, element 105. Element 105, as you can imagine, is radioactive because it's, it's a transuranium element. It's greater than element 92. And let me show you how it can be synthesized. It can be uh, synthesized in an atom smasher by atom bombardment, okay?
it's a quite complicated uh, reaction and we won't analyze it in too much detail. I'm sorry for using the dark blue font here. You might not be able to see it too well, but the way scientists set this up was that they had a, uh, a small thin wafer of this Californium element. Californium is element number 98 and it's named after California because of where it was uh, first synthesized and discovered in Berkeley, California. So scientists took a beam of nitrogen atoms, okay, and accelerate it through uh, special equipment and so on to very high speeds and it smashed into this target. From that event, some of the nuclei, right, had a head-on collision and stuck together to form um, element 105, okay? Element 105 is dubnium, okay? Dubnium, dubnium, dubnium. This is one of those uh, elements, I believe, that was uh, synthesized in uh, Russia. So it's named, it's, it has like a Russian kind of root to it. I think it's named after somebody. I should really know more about this, but I'm, I'll leave it up to you to use Wikipedia to find that out. As you can imagine, when you're smashing two things together, other stuff can go flying off. And so four neutrons are smashed out of the nucleus when that transformation occurs. The main point here is that you're going from a low element to a high element, and that's transmutation, okay? All right, um, let me show you information about, um, let's talk about half-life. This word half-life means the amount of time it takes for half the substance to decay, okay? to decay or, or react, okay? And this is used in radioactive carbon dating. Um, it was figured out in the 1940s or so, and uh, a gentleman in the 1960s won the Nobel Prize for this. And it uses, uh, as we saw before, carbon-14, which is radioactive, and it emits a uh, beta particle. Again, one out of one trillion carbon atoms in an ordinary tree or something like that is going to be uh, radioactive, okay? So very, 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 very small amounts, okay? And the half-life of this is 5,280 um, years, I believe. 5,730 years, I believe. Is that for carbon-14? Let me see here. Yes, 5,730 years, okay. Okay, so what that means is if you had 100 atoms of this substance, okay, let's say in a flute, maybe King Tut's tomb or some wooden object, right? Normally that contains lots of carbon, okay? And after 5,730 years, I'll use YR for the abbreviation here, you get 50 atoms left, okay? And after another 5,730 years, you'd have 25 atoms left. And you can see how each time you're going down by half the amount, okay? And the way this works, there's many different techniques and it's beyond the class to, talk, to go into great detail. But basically, 
a living tree can be analyzed to quantify the amount of carbon-14 in it. Like I said, one out of a trillion atoms are gonna contain this carbon-14, okay? A living tree that just died today. But if you analyze something that is carbon-dated to be 2,000 years old, um, or 15,000 years old, or something like that, it's done by analyzing how many atoms of carbon-14 are in that flute that was found you know, in the Viking era or something many hundreds of years ago, and they try to figure out how old is this object. They analyze, okay, basically, and quantify how much carbon-14 is remaining in the sample, and they compare that to living objects, a tree that was just cut down today, and then they see you know, approximately how many years old it is, okay? So in my example, if a normal tree has a hundred, you know, an object has a hundred atoms of carbon-14 in it, and that same object is analyzed and found to contain only 25 atoms of carbon-14 in it, okay, 25 atoms, that means it had to go through a total of 5,730 plus 5,730. We can do that on our calculator here. All right, just multiply by two. That's 11,000, approximately 500 years. Okay. So that's how they know a wooden object from the Viking era or found in some cave or grave or something like that is 12,000 years old. They can figure that out. Okay, based on carbon dating. So that's a pretty neat technique. All right, so that follows the half life. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, were some uh, scrolls found near the Dead Sea, so that's why they're called the Dead Sea. Uh, and uh, the, the papyrus or the paper that was used to make those scrolls, um, the, so any kind of wood, fiber, natural pigments, bone, cotton, or woolen clothing, for example, contains carbon atoms, okay? And so, as I mentioned, in 1960, the gentleman's name is Willard Libby. He received the Nobel Prize for the carbon-14 dating, okay? Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls were estimated to be 2,000 years old, okay, by the carbon-14 dating uh, technique, all right? Now, if you have something that is much older, you can um, use other elements. For example, uranium-238. This isotope has a half-life of four billion years. I'll spell this out. Half-life of four billion years. So where I'm teaching this class is in Virginia and the Appalachian Mountains in this area because of geological, uh, you know, Africa is believed to have been next to the United States here on the East Coast, and these two land masses created very high mountains. The Appalachian Mountains used to be um, very, very high, prominent mountains, and some of the oldest rocks are found in this location on the Earth. And for example, we know that some rocks are, you know, two billion or three billion or four billion. How did we? How do we know a rock is that old? Well with some information that can be performed in the laboratory, we can figure out how fast uranium-238 is decaying. We can only do that over a few years, but we can extrapolate, ex try to extrapolate out and, and do the math backwards to figure out, okay, how many atoms of uranium-238 would be in this rock, you know, when, when it when solidified and first formed for the first time on the planet Earth. And we can figure out you know, rocks have very old ages depending on their, their samples, okay? So that's how we know certain mountain ranges are young considered to other mountain ranges which are old, okay? So this area, for example, we know that the rocks are very old um, and mostly the mountains have been eroded over the years to 
be just like rolling hills basically compared to younger um, younger mountains in China or something like that, okay? All right, what about applications? Let me show you some interesting pictures here. Uh, hyperthyroidism is a condition when your thyroid gland, which is located in your neck here, uh, can uh, develop goiter in worse situations or um, the thyroid hormone has iodine in it, okay? And iodine is used to uh, image the thyroid gland because if you eat or you're injected or you take a pill of radioactive iodine, the, uh, the thyroid gland will absorb and selectively take up those iodine atoms and concentrate them in the neck. And then if you put an imager above a patient, you can basically be taking a picture of this radioactive iodine, which is emitting only a certain type of radioactive particle. And you can see if that um, person's thyroid is hyperactive, um, if, it's, if, it's under, under, if it's, you know, operating under normal uh, conditions or if it's hyperactive or hypoactive. Anyways, um, so we use that for imaging and uh, the radioactive iodine is iodine-131. It's in a pill, it's orally taken, and your goiter, uh, your, your um, thyroid grant gland will uptake this, and 24 hours later, the amount of iodine taken up by the thyroid is determined. If it takes up too much or takes up too little, you can tell if your thyroid gland is, is defective or whatnot, okay? And uh, I forget what the half-life is for this iodine isotope. It's something like 25 days or something. So the radioactivity quickly uh, is excreted and goes away from your body. But let me show you what, what it looks like. So here's a patient here with an imager above, kind of hard to see in the, in the photo there. Um, but this little cone here is a radioactive detector. It's positioned right over the neck. And then here's the type of image that it produces, right? Your thyroid is left and right, two, two parts on the side of the neck there. And, and these little dots represent radioactive uh, radioactivity, okay? The brighter green is the areas of greater radioactivity and, and blue is lesser activity, okay? So I'm not a doctor, so I can't tell you if this is normal or abnormal, but that's one of the applications, peaceful, useful applications of radioisotopes and medical imaging. Let me show you another example. This is a PET scan. PET stands for positron emission tomography. A positron, remember, is, is a form of antimatter. It's emitted by a certain fluorine isotope that can be connected to sugar. And so if you ingest sugar that's radio labeled with this radioactive isotope, it can go to different regions of your body and whatnot, and you can image uh, your brain, for example. So what we're looking at is a normal brain on the left and a brain that's affected by Alzheimer's disease on the right. Okay. What we see here is diminished regions of the yellow around the side here and less red spots. Okay. And again, I'm not a doctor. I can't really tell you about this, but that's an application. You might think antimatter sounds a lot like Star Trek. It's all make believe. It doesn't really exist but actually it's used in a PET scan. And this is used for um, medical imaging of tumors as well. Let me show you another image. This is called CT scans. Uh, CT stands for computed tomography. It's basically a, a technique to take the, the data and generate a three-dimensional image of what's going on there in the body. Uh, and it uses different radioisotopes, for example, that can target the brain. So for example, certain copper isotopes, uh, when they're attached to different proteins and things like that, will aggregate on tumors. And this, this is not a normal brain here. We've got this humongous area right here, the size of an orange or something like that. That's a tumor in somebody's brain, okay? And that's great. You don't have to go in and do an autopsy, which would involve a lot of surgery to get in there and look visually, oh yes, there's a tumor. We can do that image just like this to decide if somebody has a headache or if it's a tumor, okay? So that's a great little example of radioactivity 
Uh, you can see how there's other uh, bright spots here and here and so on, but that's a great little technique to image brain, heart, liver, lungs, whatever, many different organs. We have these techniques now in medicine. Depending on what radioisotope or medicine or drug is administered, it will target certain organs, okay? We know certain kinds of chemicals will be absorbed preferentially by the heart, the lungs, the liver, and whatnot. For imaging the lungs, you can breathe the radioactive gas, and then, you know, it's only gonna be in your lungs. So you can get in under a, an instrument and image what the radioactivity looks like. Here is an example of uh, the heart and lungs, okay? Um, the, the lungs are just the, this nice little black area. It doesn't look like uh, anything's going on there, okay? Uh, and this says heart, that looks maybe like the heart. I haven't taken a human anatomy and biology, so I'm just guessing, but uh, yeah, that's, that's an image of the heart. So a cardiologist would know, oh, that's what it's supposed to look like or not, okay? So that's great because it's a non-invasive type of uh, imagery. Obviously, we can't use x-rays very well for this type of thing because x-rays are stopped by bone. So, um, you know, bones aren't inside of these organs that we're talking about here. I want to talk a little bit about nuclear power. Nuclear power plants uh, are prevalent in the United States and France that make up about 40% of energy production. And here in the United States, there haven't been any power plants developed since new power plants built since the 1980s, as far as I know, uh, when this video has been made. It relies on radioactive uranium, which breaks down into other things. And when it breaks down into other things, it produces lots of energy. That little sun-like icon with this star thing represents energy, okay? And it reacts by something called uh, nuclear fission. Fission means breaking apart. We are, of course, interested in the energy produced by this, okay? Small amounts of uranium in a power plant can run it for months on end, just a small amount of material, whereas a coal powered plant would have to reacquire train load after train load after train load of coal and produce lots of ash and waste. As you know, here in Virginia, we had that incident with uh, Duke Power um, having some coal ash out and there was it got into the river. Either there was a flood or mismanagement of the storage area, and it really messed up the local um, water supply. This, it still is, um, the, uh, heavy metals and things like this are still showing up in the water of the, the water you drink at the drinking fountain and everything, right? The public water supply. Now you might think, okay, radioactivity sounds like a whole lot better, but remember that these byproducts that you're making are radioactive, and they have half-lives of hundreds of thousands of years or 10,000 years. So we're looking at a barrel of nuclear waste that's produced from this uranium uh, nuclear power plant, and it's gonna have to sit somewhere without rusting or leaking for more than 10 or 50,000 years. And it's hard to make sure that your metal barrel is gonna last that long. The company that made that waste is still in business. Government laws and geological um, structures and buildings are still in place after that many thousands of years, okay? So the byproducts are radioactive. So this is of course a major problem to be solved by future generations. So how does nuclear power work? Nuclear power works by the following kind of chain reaction. A chain reaction is um, when the products are reactants for the next reaction, okay? And it can go off like a bomb, a nuclear bomb, for example, if you don't control things carefully. I saw a great little uh, analogy of this. There was this room filled with mouse traps, and there was a ping pong ball on every little mouse trap. And somebody took one ping pong ball and threw it into the room. And the ping pong ball landed on a mouse trap and it snapped. 
and it made another ping pong ball fly off and hit another trap. And then two ping pong balls were flying around. And then those two ping pong balls hit. And then there was like four more ping pong balls. And then before you knew it, the whole room was like, and then there were balls flying everywhere. Okay. So that's what happens here in an uncontrolled nuclear reaction. You have a neutron hitting uranium-235, which is your unstable atom, and that breaks apart into two other things, okay? But when that breaks apart, it forms three neutrons. Each of those three neutrons can hit another uranium atom, and then each of those produce three neutrons, okay? So one thing makes three, those three things make three times three is 27, and then those 27 uh, different atoms can react to form times three, right, neutrons. So that's a chain reaction. What we normally use are things called control rods that absorb neutrons and slow down this process. And it's called a moderated nuclear reaction. So it very gently goes with a constant rate of producing lots and lots and lots of heat that can be trapped by boiling water and generators and produce steam for electri electrical generators and stuff, okay? Oh, and as I mentioned, the products that you form here, Krypton-91, uh, Barium-142 are just drawn here, but there's other uh, atoms and, and byproducts that you can form. These two can react and transmutate into other elements and everything else under these conditions. And the products from this reaction are just not things that you can just throw in the trash can or dump down the drain. They're highly radioactive and need to be carefully stored uh, with shielding and good safety measures. It's kind of pointless to show a uh, type of uh, reactor here, but this is fusion. A fusion reaction is probably in the future at some point. It's what happens in the sun. It takes hydrogen and uh, combines those to make uh, helium, okay? So we have a hydrogen, okay? We have hydrogen and the two come together to form helium. So remember, hydrogen is element number one right here on the periodic table. I'm sorry, right here on the periodic table. It's got one proton. And if you uh, mix those two, you can form helium, which has two protons. Now normally, protons repel other protons. So you have to heat these to very high temperatures and pressures in order to get them to react fast enough to stick to make a helium atom. And that's called fusion. Okay. So basically you're taking hydrogen and hydrogen and making helium plus energy, okay? There are radioactive byproducts and there is a lot of radiation produced, um, so it's not Free. It's, it's, it's not, and it has not really been achieved yet. This is uh, still technology that needs to be um, breakthrough technology in the future. Whether it's five years or 50 years from now, we cannot say, but for the past 50 years, it's always been just 10 years away. So I'm not an expert. It might really be 10 years away, but we might next, next decade say, hey, it's just 10 years away. And this is the uh, power of the sun, okay? The sun produces lots of power by this process, okay? Helium has symbol capital H, small e. It's named after Helios, the sun god. Scientists first discovered this element by looking at the sun and doing some studies of it. And they actually discovered this element on uh, the sun, not on the planet Earth. It wasn't until later they actually found helium in gas deposits in other places on the Earth. Okay, so that's helium. It's named after the sun god because it's in the sun. It's one of the products of this nuclear fusion. Fusion means coming together. As we watched in the video, there was an astronomer from the University of California, Irvine as well, that talked about supernovas, okay?
okay, where, where is gold actually synthesized? When a star explodes, there's a tremendous amount of energy and atoms smashing into each other and smaller atoms can come together to produce heavier atoms. Okay, iron in the periodic table, for example, gold in the periodic table, many of these heavier atoms, okay? Right now, the sun is primarily composed of hydrogen, 90% hydrogen, a few percent helium, and so it's busily doing a nuclear reaction day in and day out, even if we can't see it at nighttime, okay? That, in a nutshell, is all about the nuclear chemistry I want to talk about. Take a look at the textbook that I posted in Canvas. Take a look at the worksheets and the lab activities. Please, by all means, let me know if you have any questions. Thanks for watching, and please give a thumbs up, a like, and subscribe. Take it easy.